Um, thank you very much. So I'm excited to present brand new data uh, that we've got uh, modeling CAR T cells in monkeys. Um, just to start, of, uh, as, as you've heard several times now, um, CAR T cells are a very promising therapy that, that primarily have shown a lot of success so far for cancer. Um, but of course, they were originally developed in, in the 1990s for HIV. Um, but, but then where we stand now is for, for cancers that express molecules like CD19 or CD20 or, or most recently BCMA. Um, they've been modeled and, and shown to work very well in the clinic and also modeled in non-human primates, specifically talking about CD20. So there's a lot of, of precedent for how well these molecules work and, and looking, them, looking at them in large animal models um, like non-human primates. But in, in work that we've done in our Defeat HIV collaboratory in, in collaboration with uh, Larry Corey's lab and, and Thor Wagner and David Rawlings at Seattle Children's, the, the limitation that we've seen is, is that when we infect animals with an HIV-like virus called SHIV and either suppress them on art or, or leave them unsuppressed and put these CAR T cells in, um, they, send, they tend to disappear any time, over time. And if you can see, for instance, in this one animal where we happen to take an earlier time point, they're definitely there, but then they, they trail off. And this is in stark contrast um, to what's been seen for uh, virus-specific cars. So the, the question that we wanted to address is that even though these, these molecule or these cell, these car molecule modified cells work so well for cancer, what are the limitations that, that are still in existence for HIV specific car products um, and, and how can we overcome those? So in, in the Keem lab, we've, we've done a number of things to, to get at this. Um, the first is, is that uh, a number of years ago, Hans Peter identified a uh, surface molecule envelope protein that's used on lentiviral vectors called COCAL. Um, this is related to VSVG that, that most groups use for pseudotyping uh, lentiviral vectors, and this has worked quite well in our experience, especially for transducing T cells as seen here. Um, we've also developed real-time cell killing assays. This is using a platform called Excelligence. Um, I'm happy to talk about that with anyone that's interested, but basic idea is that we can make a target cell um, that expresses any antigen of interest and then mix those with our CAR T cells and monitor killing um, in real time. So this is just an example of a couple of the tools that, that we've used to, to hopefully make a better uh, monkey T cell product. Now with those tools in mind, um, we had a really nice, co nice cohort of animals that, that we had to work with. And this was within um, our U19 Beyond Heart uh, project that Hans Peter mentioned earlier, as well as Paula Cannon that they, that they co-lead. So these were animals that were originally destined for a different project. They had been infected with SHIV for between 12 and 14 weeks, and then suppressed long term for almost a year or more. Um, and we wanted to really address three questions or, or, or take on three goals here. The first was to make a more balanced product, and this is something that, that Jim talked about previously, that um, a lot of CAR-T products, especially for cancer, have had a lot of success, even though they're skewed towards CD8, and that's been great. Um, but in the case of HIV, it might be that these CD4 CAR-modified cells are also very important. So we've uh, adapted strategies to balance the CAR-T products so we have 4s and 8s that are CAR-modified. The second thing we want to do is make a less differentiated product, and this really gets at how we culture the cells and the cytokines that we use, um, specifically IL-2, which we feel more and more like is really good for making a ton of cells that are, are big in number but not necessarily in quality. So we've moved away from IL-2 and identified cytokine cocktails that, that can, we think, retain more of a memory phenotype and hopefully more function in vitro. And the third thing that we addressed in this study was whether it would be helpful to provide an artificial source of cell-associated antigen. And this goes back to the fact that in these animals that have been suppressed for a year, uh, I think it's, it's pretty clear that there's not going to be a lot of envelope, which is what these CAR T cells are going to see. There's not going to be a lot of envelope expressed um, in these cells. So using these animals, that what we did is after a year of suppression, um, we made CAR T cells uh, from, from these autologous, from cells that were frozen down from each of these animals, an autologous product. We put them into the animals while they were on any retroviral therapy. Um, and then we let them go four weeks before we took them, took them off and looked what happened um, during an analytical treatment interruption. So um, I want to highlight the work of, of Blake Rust, who's a senior postdoc in the lab that's worked uh, very closely with me to develop this protocol. Um, and, and a lot of the objectives that I just showed to you are outlined here. So 
um, through a lot of really um, fruitful collaborations with, with Simi Tureen, formerly from Juno, um, we, we tried to model a lot of the, the same uh, parameters that Juno uses to make CAR T cells here in Seattle and the monkey, specifically by balancing CD4 and 8, separately isolating them and, and really controlling the ratio in the product. Um, we activate those T cells ex vivo. Um, this, this really started a, a really great collaboration that we've had with Jim Riley, where we've moved away from using bead based stimulation for the T cells and towards a, a cell based stimulation. So he has uh, an, an artificial antigen presenting cell or AAPC um, that we use to stimulate these cells um, rather than using uh, CD328 beads that most groups use. After we stimulate the cells, uh, we, we modified them in, in two steps. Um, the total resting or the total unactivated cell population was uh, modified with CCR5 CRISPR. So the schematics are a little off here. The, the CCR5 editing was before the cells were activated. Then we allowed the cells to activate, and then we modified them with an SIV-based antiviral vector um, that expressed the, the CD4 CAR molecule. And we're using the very same CD4 CAR that Jim just told you about that he's optimized in his previous studies. Um, we codon optimize that for rhesus, but otherwise it's, it's the same one that he's previously published. Um, the thing that I want to note that I think is most important in these studies is we decided to go with no conditioning regimen in, in these studies. Um, we've, we've had some experience with low levels of conditioning. Um, we've done this both for HIV cars and, and CD20 cars. And we wanted to ask the question, in the absence of conditioning, could we see any effect? Just thinking about that this would be a more translatable approach uh, in patients. We expanded these modified cells for eight to nine days and then, and then put them in the, into the autologous animal. And again, um, let those animals go for four weeks before we took them off. But again, using a, a reagent that was provided to us very kindly by Jim as well as Amy Payne from UPenn, um, we added one more step, which is getting at this, autolo or getting at this artificial antigen boost. So um, there's a cell line that was developed by Amy that's basically a stable envelope expressing um, variant of K562. There are a number of these cell lines out there, and it's kind of tricky to get a, a cell line that stably expresses on because it, because it's toxic, but through whatever mechanism this was able to, to be done, um, these cells express envelope at very high levels and grow just as well as, as normal K562s and have been very easy to work with on our hands. So we can grow up a ton of these. We can then irradiate them. And basically what we're then putting into the animal is a large bolus of, of cell-associated antigen. And, and the way that we set this up was basically to do this right in the middle of the ARC phase. So at week, week 64, we put the uh, CAR T cells in. About two weeks later, we put in the cell-associated antigen. And then two weeks after that, um, we took the animals off therapy and, and we're monitoring um, viral rebound during this time as well as the expansion of the CAR T cells. So what I'm showing you here is the infusion um, numbers for the, for the animals. We put in between uh, 70 and 170 million total um, cells in each animal. They're about 30 to 40 percent marked, so relatively low efficiency for, for other cars such as CD20, we can get up to 90 percent marking. So there is something interesting about these, these virus-specific cars at the vector level. But we did get a pretty good dose of, of modified cells, around 60 million or so uh, per animal. And as you can see, our, our approach to balance out the 4 and 8 ratios did very well. We actually put in more 4s in these animals. Um, than we did dates that were car marked. So this is the in vivo data, just to, to cut to where it gets really interesting, is, is that in, in the first phase, what we saw when we put the, the cells in, um, what we're looking at here is all four animals, and you're looking at CD3 car marked, as well as CD3, CD8, um, and then CD3 positive, CD8 negative. Um, that last one in green is, is really our surrogate for CD4 T cells, but we can't directly label CD4 because of the CD4 car and the overlap in those markers. So when you see green, we're, we're indirectly looking at CD4s. So when we put the, the cells in, they start to show so the, some of the same kinetics that we've seen previously in the defeat HIV studies, which is that they go down and start to show signs that they're not coming back with maybe a few blips here and there. Um, the, the first time point after we put in these artificial arms expressing cells, we saw a, a nice little increase in, in the number of cells at, at that first time point. But was, what was really striking is, is that when we took the animals off therapy, even at the time point, the day that we took them off therapy, they were already expanding further. So this was very, very exciting data. This is, is the, the first evidence we've seen that we can make these cells expand in vivo. And they continued to expand after um, treatment was interrupted, as you can see at that, at that first point, post-ATI time point. And interestingly, they, they started to go now, down now to very um, low levels. And that last time point 
Um, it's just from this past Friday, so this is very new data. Now, the, the thing that we're mo most excited about, I think, is that we've taken these animals off art, and I, I think this is very hard to see, so just to walk you through, the, the animals came off art about right here, and, and I'm showing you the number of days post-ATI. So in the first group of animals um, through our time point last Friday, uh, we're at day 25. Um, one of those animals is rebounded, and he rebounded at day 18 post-ATI. Um, the other animal continues to be suppressed with no art on board through day 25. And in the second group, which is about a week behind, you can see that we're only at day 18. So the, one of the limitations, of course, with this study is we didn't have a matched control group, but what we do have that, that is somewhat of a surrogate is a, a wealth of data using the same virus and, and either the same art regimen or a very similar art regimen, um, both in rhesus macaques and pigtail macaques. So in a study that we're doing right now that Sandra talked about earlier, uh, we had a cohort of 24 animals, and you could see that the mean to viral rebound in those animals was about two weeks. And in our previous uh, pigtail macaque study that we published a few years ago, uh, the mean time to rebound was about 17 to 18 days. So we're right at that really critical period. And, and again, things are looking really good, but I want to emphasize that this, this is very early on and, and we're continuing to track these animals very closely. So just to wrap up and model what we think is happening, in the first phase, the, the, the cells are going in. They're, they're not seeing a lot of antigen. Um, I think this is often referred to as the eclipse phase for cancer cars, so you don't necessarily see even an effective car work very well at this point. But based on our previous data, if we hadn't gone with this on boost, we would have not expected to see these cells come back. However, by supplying this artificial source of cell-associated antigen, and we think that that cell-associated part is really important, we're able to see these cells come back such that on the day of ATI, we time this really well so that when we take art away, the cells are really in an effective expansion phase. And following ATI, the activated cars are potentially responding to viral cells as they rebound on a per cell basis. And again, I say that with a caveat that we're very early on and, and we'll see what happens if, if these three out of four animals continue um, to show undetectable virus in the absence of therapy. So, just to wrap up then, um, what I've showed you is we overhauled how we make um, CAR T cells for, for monkeys. I think this is more generally an approach to overhaul how we can make CAR T cells for patients as well under the model that different diseases are going to have different needs for what that product can do in vivo. Um, we expanded the cells in vitro and we showed that we could expand them in vivo using a cell associated boost. And the uh, expansion continues through, through ATI, and the most important point here is even though we're seeing these cells expand, we're not seeing rebound to plasma viremia at, at very early time points. So as I've mentioned, we're, we're very closely monitoring these animals. We haven't seen any signs of CRS. They've been, been, been quite healthy. Um, we're, try, we're interested in identifying correlates down the line of, of what was uh, related to this expansion, for instance, integration site analysis, which is something that we do a lot in the lab. Um, the last thing that I'll, I'll talk about is our IHC. So this is from one of our other U19 Beyond Heart projects with Scott Kitchen and Angie Zinn, where we've been looking at stem cell-derived cars. And Isaac and his wife Valerie in the lab have developed a really nice uh, IHC assay to stain these cars directly and look for localization to be cell follicles. So these are stem cell-derived cars, which is sort of a totally different story, but we're going to apply um, the same assay now for the T cell cars in, in the study that I just told you about. So. Uh, the community summary, the, the key question here was how can we make these CAR T cells better? They work very well for cancer, but um, in, in previous studies in, in large animal models and in patients haven't worked that well um, uh, in, in, in those models and in patients. Um, what we really went in with the hypothesis of is that these cells needed to see viral proteins on those infected cells, and a person on art doesn't have a lot of those proteins to see. So we supplied them artificially, and we think that that was really effective in, in getting the cells to take off. Um, again, the, the basis for all of these studies is that we think this is a really promising approach for, for long-term uh, remission for HIV in the way, same way that it's uh, been shown to lead to long-term remission um, in cancer. And the, the clinical trial that Jim just talked about is going to be evaluating a very similar approach. And this is setting up a really nice back and forth where we can ask questions in our model that he can't um, address in patients. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of their lab and again highlight Blake, who, who really drove all these studies and has brought a, a lot of really valuable T cell immunology and expertise to the lab, uh, where we've just traditionally done a lot of stem cell work. 
Um, I, I especially want to thank all the people that we work on these car projects, so the Defeat HIV Collaborate, Collaboratory, where we're the, where the Animal Corps support. And finally, these Beyond Heart grants, where we've had a lot of um, collaboration between these different programs, and the way that's been set up has been really great, that we've been able to, to set things up and work with Angie and, and Scott in the stem cell-based cars, and also comparing those to T-cell cars. And then more recently, um, our group with Hans-Peter and Paula working with Jim uh, to, to model a really effective therapy for, for CAR T-cells in monkeys. Thank you, we'll take any questions. <laughs> This is a practical question. <clears throat> you can answer it, or Jim Riley could answer it. Um, because either the monkeys or the humans from which we're making these cars will be on an antiretroviral regimen, and then maybe RT inhibitors or <clears throat> integrase yeah. inhibitors, both of which will block lentiviral transduction, do we have to put the, the recipient, the future recipient, on an ATI when you collect the cells? Yeah, so we've published for stem cells, and that's a huge problem. Um, the, the tricks that we've used for T cells are, are twofold. Number one, for the monkeys, we can, of course, collect the product before they're infected. That's not really reasonable in the clinic. What we did, did in this study, actually, is we had a separate set of cells that were from infected and suppressed animals. Um, we put them into activation culture. We didn't do an ATI, but we put them into activation culture after we electroporated them, thinking that maybe we'd be able to uh, stimulate that washout by the zap. That did seem to partially help. We did get good transduction efficiency after doing that, but it still wasn't as good as an uninfected product. So that's something that we, it's gonna lower efficiency, but I think we can sort of work our way around it. Because we use the CCR5 ZFNs, we do that in resting cells. And so that buys us two to three days so that the antiretrovirals can leak out. And we, we get actually very good transduction uh, without, you know, it might be slightly lower, but it's certainly 60, 70 percent range. Is there anything uh, that in, in this system that would uh, prevent the CAR T cells from getting infected in the case of CD8s via the CD4 on the CAR? and for the CD4s via the car and or the endogenous CD4. Yeah, so in this project they were CCR5 edited. I didn't show you that data. The efficiency was not as great as, as uh, for instance, Thor I know has really great uh, editing efficiencies with CRISPR. We only got about 30 or 40 percent. I think that might have to do with the timing of when we did it. Um, but I think, you know, based on, based on what Thor has shown, we have the potential to edit these at very high rates. <laughs> 